It's great to be here with you this morning once again. As Derek mentioned, I'm going to be continuing this series called What Do You See? And before uh, the COVID-19 virus hit, we were in the middle of this series. I had just preached two messages with you. We had talked in our first message about the dangers of being short-sighted. And then in the second message, the dangers of being far-sighted. And we've been talking about the fact that Jesus came to open the eyes of the blind. And he wasn't just talking about physical blindness, but he was actually talking about spiritual blindness. And so we've been looking at, are we seeing things from the perspective of heaven? Are we seeing things from God's perspective? And talking about the dangers when we're not seeing things correctly. And so when the COVID-19 hit, we sort of put that series uh, to the side and we've been just sort of dealing with things that are maybe more current and relevant uh, right to this COVID-19 situation. But now we're ready to sort of resume the series. And so last week, Jeff Barnhart preached a great message with us. I've heard so many, good feed, uh, so many good comments and feedback about that. Kimberly Gell's going to continue the message next week. But here I am in the middle, and I'm doing a message that I wasn't planning to do, but one that I feel fits in with this series. And so I'm going to continue it this morning. And so we're going to be talking about this whole idea of what do you see and talking about something I'm calling feast mode. A number of years ago, actually it was about 17 years ago, I took my first trip to Africa. Actually, it was I took two trips in the same summer. And on my second trip to Africa in the summer, I went with a couple uh, known as Rachel and Gordon Hickson. Many that are watching me today would know who they are. An amazing ministry couple. And they had invited Angela and I to go with them to Africa and we were going to Zimbabwe first and then we'd end up being in Kenya. And those of you that know me know that I'm a a very picky eater. I've always been a picky eater. I drove my mom crazy when I was a kid with how picky I was. And so I've never been a true missionary in the sense of just loving to go to the nations of the world and sample their food. I like Canadian food and I don't like to detour too much from that. And so this whole idea of going and spending a month in Africa and eating the foreign food and probably food that I wasn't going to like was really scaring me and and I was really nervous. In fact, it was probably the thing that I was the most nervous about heading uh, to Zimbabwe that summer was how am I going to survive a month without Canadian food? And so there was people that were even praying for me that God would give me the grace, you know, to be able to do this. Well, when we got to Zimbabwe, we were working with a, a minis- uh, sorry, with a missionary couple, and they were originally from Ireland. And what I would discover right away was that this woman, uh, the, the wife of this ministry couple from, from Ireland, was an amazing cook. And not only that, she had some hired help that helped her in the kitchen. And so in the morning before we would go off to do the the leadership conference that we were doing, we would have the most elaborate breakfast, and then we'd come home for, for supper at the end of the day, and we would have this feast that was absolutely amazing prepared for us. I had never eaten so good, I thought. Until after a week or so went by and and the leadership conference was over and we had a few days off, we flew from Harare down to Victoria Falls and we stayed at the Victoria Falls Hotel. Now the Victoria Falls Hotel is an amazing hotel right overlooking the Victoria Falls. The Queen of England has stayed there. Uh, this was a hotel that would cost four to five hundred dollars US a night 17 years ago. Well, I don't have that kind of money and we would normally never have stayed in such a hotel except that somehow these missionaries were able to get us the local rate, which was about $30 US a night. And so here we stayed in the most elaborate hotel for several days. I've never stayed in a hotel so nice. And part of the hotel stay was that we would get the free breakfast and the free supper. It was all included. And when I say supper, I'm talking about a feast like I had never seen before. I mean, this feast was absolutely elaborate. Every night, every kind of meat and vegetable, there was things I had never seen before. I ate things I had never seen before. And normally I'm not too, as I said, I'm not too... uh, uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? 
uh, dangerous <laughs> when it comes to eating, but I had to try some things. And one of the things I remember trying was a crocodile tail. It was like the tail had been cut into slices, and I'm like, man, when am I ever going to eat crocodile tail again? And so I had some, and yes, it does taste like chicken. Doesn't everything taste like chicken? And so, I mean, this was, this was the craziness of this feast that we were having. It was amazing, all the, all the different kinds of drinks that you could drink. There was entertainment that was there every night. And I remember thinking to myself, there are people at home in Regina that are praying for me. My own mother is probably interceding. God, give him the grace to be able to survive this month. And I was eating like I had never eaten before. It was like a feast Every night when I came home, I had gained 10 pounds. That is the truth. And I've never lost it. Interesting how that, how that works. But I'm telling you this story because it was an unexpected feast. I had no idea what was about to happen. In the Bible, we are told about a great feast that God has prepared for us. This feast is mentioned in Psalm chapter 23, which is a famous psalm. Even people that don't go to church too often are familiar with this psalm. King David wrote this psalm. Of course, David, before he became a great king, was a shepherd boy. And so in this psalm, he's describing God as a shepherd. David had a real intimate relationship with the Lord. It was really close. And, and he saw God like a shepherd. And, and there was this imagery that David portrays for us, this metaphor that, that he gives us. And, and it's a metaphor of how God being the shepherd is, is one who leads us lovingly. He protects us. He provides for us. Even through those dark valleys, God's with us. He's always there for us. And many have found strength. And many have found peace through this psalm. But I want to read it for you this morning. It goes like this. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. For you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast. And this is what we're going to talk about this morning. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessing. Surely, goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will live in the house of the Lord forever. And so as I mentioned, this psalm begins with, uh, with David describing God as a shepherd. And there's some powerful imagery contained within this psalm as David describes this God who leads us to a place of rest and peace and strength and through these dark valleys. But then in verse 5 in the psalm, the image shifts from God being the shepherd to God being a host. And this host who has prepared a feast for us. And this feast, I want to suggest to you, is totally unexpected because of where the feast takes place. The feast takes place right in the middle of our enemies. When you think about it, this sounds absolutely ridiculous. Who has a feast in the middle of their enemies? When the bullets are flying, when the enemy is at your door, you're lucky if you can have a few bites, if you can sneak in a few bites. I mean, I've watched some war movies. I've never seen right in the middle of those trenches an elaborate feast. If you can just uh, find something in your backpack to quickly get into your mouth, you're, you feel lucky. But here the psalmist is describing God preparing this feast right in the middle of our enemies. It's totally unexpected. Now, I've never eaten a feast that I could eat in just a couple minutes. When you are sitting down at the table for an elaborate feast, you're going to be there for a while. 
And I've never had a feast all by myself. There's always people around me. There's conversation that's happening. There's laughter. There's joy. It's usually a time of celebration. And it's elaborate. Sometimes if you've had a great feast, like I'm thinking like Christmas or or Easter or Thanksgiving, those kinds of feasts, sometimes at the end of the feast, you got to have a nap afterwards just to help you with the digestion. I would suggest there is nothing like a good feast. I mean, times of celebration without food, they, they don't make sense. These are some of the best times of our lives. And so here as David is describing God as this shepherd, as he's describing the goodness of God and the shepherd heart of God leading us into blessing, somehow it's just not quite enough to give us the full picture. And so David turns the imagery to this host, inviting us to this banquet that's been prepared for us in the most unlikely of places. Amazing. When I read this psalm, I think of John 10, verse 10, and I quote this often. It's a famous verse. Jesus made this statement. He said, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. And so Jesus is describing for us our enemy, the enemy who's at the door. And his plans are to destroy us. His plans are to rob from us. His plans are to take from us. And Jesus describes the enemy, but then he describes his plan. And he says, I have plans to give you life and not just an okay life, not just surviving, but I have plans to give you an abundant life, life to the full. You've got the enemy at your door. It's it's like David describing in Psalm 23. This enemy all around us, he's got his plans to destroy us, but God says, I've got plans for a feast. I've got plans to give you abundance right in the presence of your enemies. Church, what I'm saying to you this morning is that God wants you to live your life in feast mode. In feast mode. He wants us to live out of his abundance. He wants us to live out of his extravagant goodness. Now you might be wondering, what does feast mode have to do with a series on what do you see? What does feast mode have to do with vision? What does feast mode have to do with perspective? But this is is how I'm tying it in this morning. You see, because... The feast happens often in an unexpected place. When the feast happens in the presence of our enemies and we're not expecting it and so we often don't see it. We're often blind to the feast because it happens in a time when we don't expect it. You see, we think that once Jesus drives away all my enemies... Once Jesus makes my life perfect, then I'll be able to testify of his abundance. Then I'll be able to testify of his feast once he's driven the enemies away. And we think when things are going well, when we're proclaiming his goodness and his abundance, when we're living in feast mode, that's what we think when things are going well. But when things are not so good, we're not in feast mode usually. Usually we are in what I would call survival mode. And when you are in survival mode, you are absolutely consumed with the enemy that's all around you. And because you're consumed with the enemy that's all around you, you become blind to the feast that God has for you. We become blind to the table. We think, this isn't a time for feasting. This is a time for survival. But church, I want to challenge you this morning. There is always a feast prepared for you. God always has a feast prepared for you, even in the presence of your enemies, even in the unexpected times of your life. And if you're waiting for your enemies to all be gone before you eat, you're going to miss the feast that God has prepared for you. David gives us the same imagery in Psalm chapter 34, just a few psalms later. 
Now, I want to give you the background of this psalm. At this time in David's life, he's running from Saul, who's trying to kill him. And he goes to the Philistines. He goes to the town of Gath, where King Achish lived. Now, if, if the name Gath sounds familiar, it might be because you remember that the giant Goliath, who David killed, and you know the story that everybody knows, Goliath was from Gath. And this shows you just how desperate David was to get away from Saul, that he would literally go to, to the Philistines and even to the town of Gath to get away from Saul. Now, if you've just killed the greatest hero in the, uh, in the nation of the Philistines and now go to the hometown of this hero, people have heard about you. And people are going to be suspicious of you. What is your motives? And so some of the officers of King Achish's army, they weren't so happy that David, the giant killer, the one who had killed Goliath, who was from their town, was now showing up to hide from King Saul. This didn't make any sense to them, and so they got very nervous about what his motives were, and so they went to King Achish and said, we don't, we're not happy with this, you got to get this guy out of here, and David is in such fear, well, maybe fear isn't the right word, but he realizes he's in jeopardy, he realizes he is surrounded by his enemies, and this isn't looking good, and so David pretends that he's insane, that he's gone mad, that he's crazy, to keep himself alive. In fact, part of his act was that he allowed drool to run down his beard. This is the background of Psalm chapter 34. Most of us would say David was simply in survival mode. But was he? It doesn't sound like a time of feasting. But listen to the song that David wrote at this time, Psalm 34. He said, I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak his praises. I will boast only in the Lord. Let all who are helpless take heart. Come, let us tell of the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. I prayed to the Lord and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. David may have been in a time of fear, but he said he freed me from all my fears. He says those who look to him, to who? To God. And this is the message. Where are you looking? Can you see God? Can you see the table? Can you see the feast in the presence of your enemies? David said, those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy. Not just a little joy, radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. In my desperation, I prayed and the Lord listened to me. He saved me from all my troubles, for the angel of the Lord is a guard. He surrounds and defends all who fear him. Notice verse 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see. He's good. All the joys of those who take refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his godly people, for those who fear him, notice this, will have all they need. Notice verse 10. Even strong young lions sometimes go hungry, but those who trust in the Lord will lack no good thing. In other words, those who trust in the Lord, there is a continual feast. David's in the presence of his enemies. He's totally surrounded. He's even got drool running down his beard. But David was not blind in that moment to the feast that was actually prepared for him. David wasn't waiting for his life to be enemy free, to have peace and joy and strength. He wasn't consumed with the enemy. His eyes had been trained to focus differently. His eyes were looking to the Lord and they were radiant with joy. Radiant with joy. On the outside, he may have had some drool running down his face. 
He may have looked like uh, he was uh, uh, in shame. But he's writing in Psalm 34, there is no shadow of shame on my face. You see, David wasn't in survival mode. He was in feast mode. And as he's sitting at this feast, eating of the goodness of God, drinking of the goodness of God, with his face radiant right in the presence of his enemies, he shoots out this invitation, come, come join me at the table. Come and taste for yourself, and you will see that the Lord is good. If David had his guitar, he might have been singing a song you've heard before. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. I'm surrounded by you. He might have added a few lines. It may look like I have drool running down my face. But in the spirit, I've got grease running down my face because I'm having a feast. I'm having a feast. The one that was prepared for me. From this elaborate table, David gives us an invitation. Come and join me at the table and taste and see for yourself. David is living in abundance. He says, oh, the joys of those who trust in the Lord. He said, even the strong young lions get hungry. Even the strong ones have times in their life when they are hungry, but those who eat at the table, there's always an abundance. There's always a feast. My friends, God wants us to see this morning that he always has a feast prepared for us. God hasn't called us to just live in survival mode. God has called us to live in feast mode. And the message this morning is that you can have a feast even in the presence of your enemies. An unexpected feast. You see, Jesus never promised us that life would be easy. He never promised us an enemy-free life. He never promised us that we wouldn't go through some pain in this world. In fact, he said the opposite. He said in John 16, 33, in this world, you're going to have trouble. But cheer up. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Jesus was saying, in this world of trouble, you don't have to live with doom and gloom on your face. You can be in good cheer because I've overcome the world. He's talking about the feast. And the principle of Scripture is that with God, we can thrive even in the presence of our enemies. Even in the wilderness, even in the desert seasons of our life, we can thrive. In the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah is prophesying to the Israelites. You know, they're about to go into 70 years of captivity because of their sin, because of their disobedience to God, but they're not going into captivity without a promise. And God hasn't abandoned them. And I want you to notice that even in this time of doom and gloom, that that Jeremiah reminds them that even as they're about to go into this wilderness time in their life, even in the wilderness, even in the presence of their enemies, so to speak, that they can flourish. It says in Jeremiah 17, verse 5, this is what the Lord says, Cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans, who rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from the Lord. They are stunted like stunted shrubs in the desert with no hope for the future. They will live in the barren wilderness and in uninhabited salty land. But blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They are like trees planted along a riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees, notice this, are not bothered by the heat. They're not worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. Jeremiah is prophesying to the Children of Israel, look, you're going to go into captivity. You're going to go into a wilderness time. But if you will keep your hope, if you will keep your confidence in the Lord, even in a desert time, you're going to prosper. Even in the presence of your enemies, you're going to flourish. 
Sometimes when the drought is long, and, and Jeremiah is talking about the, this length of drought, he said, such trees are not bothered by the heat. They're not worried by long months of drought. But here's what often happens to us. Sometimes when the drought is long, our eyes begin to drift from the Lord and onto our circumstances. They begin to drift from the table to the enemy. And I want to suggest to you that when that happens, that our roots stop reaching into that river and we begin to dry up. But Jeremiah is promising us here that no matter what season, no matter what kind of heat, no matter how long, those whose eyes are on the Lord, they will always be alive, they will always be green, they will always be flourishing. They will never stop producing fruit. You see, God's abundant life operates in every season of our life. God's abundant life is to operate in the wilderness times. It's to operate when we're in the presence of our enemies. Church, stay in feast mode. Don't let your circumstances blind you to the table that God has prepared for you. Now, there is a story in the scripture that I want to tell you this morning of a woman who is living in survival mode. In fact, I would suggest to you she wasn't really even in survival mode. She was preparing to die. She was in a wilderness, literally, with no hope. She was consumed by the circumstances that were around her. And because she was so consumed to the circumstances, she became blind to the provision of God and the goodness of God that was available to her in that moment. She was missing the feast in the presence of her enemies. The woman I'm talking about this morning was named Hagar. Hagar was an Egyptian girl, and she was the slave girl of Sarah, who was the wife of Abraham. Now, you remember that God had promised Abraham that he would have more descendants than there were stars in the sky. And Abraham was talking with God and he said, yes, but my wife is barren. And so maybe I should uh, have this child through, through, through a slave or through one of the servants. And God had said to him, no, that's not how it's going to happen. It's not going to be through a servant. It's going to be your own heir, your own flesh and blood with Sarah that you're going to have this child. This was in, ver in, in Genesis chapter 15. But then in Genesis chapter 16, uh, some time has gone by and the promise of God has not come to pass. And so Sarah is beginning to doubt in her heart that this is ever going to happen. And she's looking at the fact that she's barren and she's looking at the fact that she's getting old in age. And she says to, to Abraham, who obviously his faith is right on life support itself. And she says, Abraham, it's clear that God is against me. And so uh, if you're going to have an heir, you better have it through my servant. And she said, I want you to go to Hagar. And have a child through her. And so Abraham listens to Sarah. And he, has, uh, he goes to Hagar. He sleeps with her. She becomes pregnant. Well, after Hagar gets pregnant, Sarah begins to resent her. She's jealous of her. And she begins to complain to Abraham about her. And in Genesis 16, verse 6, Abram, his name was Abram at that time. Later, God would change it to Abraham. He, Abram replied, look, she is your servant, so deal with her as you see fit. Then Sarai treated Hagar so harshly that she finally ran away. The angel of the Lord found Hagar beside a spring of water in the wilderness. This was a desert season of her life. Along the road to Shur, the angel said to her, Hagar, Sarai's servant, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she replied. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her authority. Then he added, I will give you more descendants than you can count. He's talking to Hagar. And the angel also said, you are now pregnant and will give birth to a son. You are to name him Ishmael, which means God hears, for the Lord has heard your cry of distress. If you skip down to verse 13 and 14, it says, Thereafter, Hagar used another name to refer to the Lord who had spoken to her. She said, You are the God who sees me. 
She also said, I have truly seen the one who sees me. Or have I truly seen the one who sees me? So that well was named Bir Lahoi Roy, or something like that, which means well of the living one who sees me. And so here we see Hagar. She is a victim of circumstance. She had become pregnant, not by her own choice, but because her master had taken her and gotten her pregnant. It wasn't, it wasn't her fault. She didn't ask for this. And now her, her, her master, Sarah, has gotten jealous at her and, and, and treated her so harshly that she's run away. And she's in this total wilderness, physically, but also in her personal life as well. In this place of brokenness, the angel of the Lord, I mean, it's God. He shows up, and he shows up with a feast. He tells her that God has heard her. In fact, he tells her, I want you to name your son Ishmael, which means, uh, which means uh, what, what did it tell us, that God, that God hears it means God hears. He said, I want you to name your son Ishmael so that every time you call his name and every time he hears you calling, there will be a remembrance that the God you serve is a God who hears. And then he says to her, I'm going to give you more descendants than you can even count. He gives her this promise. Now, Hagar is so impacted by this experience, she has become so full from this, from this feast that even though she had been in a time of desperation and despair, she is willing to go back to her master. She has discovered God. She's discovered a depth of grace and mercy that she didn't know. She has encountered a feast in the presence of her enemies. Her relationship with God has dramatically changed. In fact, she has a new name for God. She understands him in a way she never knew him before. He's the one who sees me. She goes back full. Well, then in Genesis 21, uh, Sarah eventually has her son, Isaac is born and Abraham throws a feast, ironically, when Isaac is weaned. And at the feast, Ishmael is sort of making fun of Isaac. Sarah sees this. It throws her into a rage. She's ticked off. And she says uh, in verse 9, But Sarah saw Ishmael, the son of Abraham, and her Egyptian servant Hagar making fun of her son Isaac. So she turns to Abraham and demanded, Get rid of that slave woman and her son. He is not going to share the inheritance with my son Isaac. I won't have it. And so in verse 14, it says, Abraham got up early the next morning, prepared food in a container of water, strapped them on Hagar's shoulders. Then he sent her away with their son, and she wandered aimlessly in the wilderness of Be Beersheba. There she is again in the wilderness. And when the water was gone, she put the boy in the shade of a bush. Then she went and sat down by herself about a hundred yards away. I don't want to watch the boy die, she said, as she bursts into tears. Hagar is back in the wilderness again. She's wandering around. She has nowhere to go. She has no sense of direction. All her water is gone. So she places the boy 100 yards away to die. She doesn't want to hear him crying. She doesn't want to see him die. And in that place, she bursts into tears. She's in that desert place in her life again. She's been here before, though. And she should know that she has a God who hears her. Every time she calls the name of Ishmael, it should be reminding her, yes, but there's a God who hears. But she is surrounded by circumstances that seem to defy the reality of God. And so she has lost her perspective. Her enemies are closing in around her. But verse 17, but God heard the boy crying. Of course he would. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven. Hagar, what's wrong? Don't be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Go and comfort him. And he gives her the promise again. For I will make a great nation from his descendants. He's not going to die, Hagar. There's a great nation that's coming from him. And notice verse 19. Then God opened Hagar's eyes and she saw a well full of water. Not just a little bit, 
full. And she quickly filled her water container and gave the boy a drink. And God was with the boy as he grew up in the wilderness. He didn't take him out of the wilderness. And he became a skillful archer. And he settled in the wilderness of Paran. His mother arranged for him to marry a woman from the land of Egypt. And so once again, Hagar discovers exactly what David would sing about years later, that God is near to the brokenhearted. When our enemies surround us, God has a table prepared for us. And suddenly, God opened Hagar's eyes, and she was able to see the well. I want to suggest to you, the well didn't just magically appear. The well had been there the whole time. But she was so consumed with circumstances. She was so consumed with the fact that she was surrounded by her enemies, that she was in the middle of the desert, that she missed that God had a table for her. She missed the well. And it wasn't just a well that had a little bit of water. It was full. It was full. But even greater than the physical well was the voice of God who was once again reassuring her that his plans for the boy were still in play. He hadn't changed his mind. He was still going to be a great nation. He was still with them. It may look like you're surrounded. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. I want you to notice that God didn't take her out of the wilderness. But she began to flourish right there. The boy grew. He became a skillful archer. A wife was found for him. When Hagar's eyes were opened, she discovered that even in the presence of our enemies, God has a well. God has a table prepared for us. Even in the desert places of our lives, we can flourish. His goodness and mercy, David said, will follow me all the days of my life. Not just on the good days of my life, but all the days of my life. The, the dry days, the desert days, the enemy days. His goodness will follow me all the days of my life. Church, I hope this message has encouraged you this morning, and I want to conclude by leaving you with four quick observations. Number one, it's easy to lose sight of the feast when the enemies are at the door. And so we need to remember that we have an enemy who comes to steal and kill and destroy. And one of the ways that he does that is that he blinds our eyes to the truth. He blinds us to the feast. He wants to consume us with fear. He wants to consume us with discouragement. He wants to consume us with hopelessness. You remember the story of Elisha and his servant when the army had come against the nation of Israel and Elisha's servant looked over the wall and all he could see was the army and he began to panic and Elisha said, Oh God, open his eyes. And suddenly the servant's eyes were open and he saw that even though they were surrounded, they were surrounded by the armies of God as well. The second observation that, we, that I want to make this morning is that the strength for the battle is actually found at the table. In this world we'll have trouble. Jesus told us that. We're not going to be enemy free our whole lives. But we can live in abundance. There is no lack at the table. Paul would boast that even when I'm weak, I'm strong. Because God's grace was sufficient for him. In other words, Paul would say, when I prayed, God didn't take away my enemies. But he gave me the grace to stand against them. He just fed me instead. I said, oh God, look at my enemies. And God said, look at my feast." He always gave me the grace and the strength I needed. Paul was the one who said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You see, at this feast, David described it. He said, my cup overflows. He doesn't just give me enough for me. He gives me enough to give away. I'm overflowing in the goodness of God. He said at this table, he anoints my head with oil. If you have a car and the oil in the engine runs out, that engine is going to seize up. But David said, I don't seize up, even in the presence of my enemies, even when I'm feeling tired, even when I'm feeling weak, even when I'm feeling like it's over for me, I get at the table, and at the table is all the nourishment I need. At the table is an abundance of grace. At the table is an abundance of goodness. At the table, he pours oil over my head. 
And I come out of the table. I come out of the presence of God anointed. I come out full. I come out dripping in the goodness of God, overflowing in the goodness of God. I have the strength to meet the enemy that's at my door. There's a continual anointing. Number three, the third observation is only the hungry get filled. David said, come on. He gave us an invitation. He said, come and taste and see. Come, come join me at the table. There's the invitation. Will you accept it? No host prepares a table for themselves. God has a table prepared for us. He doesn't want to be at the table alone. He's inviting you. Come on. Come to the feast. I've been preparing this for you. He's the great host. There's an invitation, but will you come? Are you hungry? And the fourth and final observation is this. Jesus is the feast. David said, taste and see that the Lord is good. It's the Lord who's the feast. He's the bread of life. It's in his presence that there is fullness of joy. It's at his right hand that there are pleasures forevermore. Church, there is a depth of relationship with God that can't be found. Listen to me. There is a depth of relationship with God that can't be found outside of the wilderness. There is a depth of relationship that can't be found in a place of comfort. Hagar, when she was in the wilderness, discovered God in a way that she didn't know him. She even called him by a new name. There was a depth of relationship. She discovered he's the God who sees me. He's the God who hears me. She didn't know that before the wilderness. There was a depth of knowledge that she would not have found anywhere else. If you can get your eyes off of your circumstances... If you can turn them on the Lord, if you will let your roots grow down deep, and they have to go down deep if, in order to survive in the desert seasons, I believe you will discover the depths of His riches, the depth of His glory, and the depth of His grace in a way that you have never experienced it before. And so there is an invitation this morning. Come on. Come on, church. Join me at the table. I've got a feast prepared for you. There's an invitation to come and discover God in a new way. Yesterday's manna is stale, but God has a new feast for us every single day. I want to close this morning by reading you one last scripture. You know, the Bible, Jesus talked about a great feast, not just here on this earth, but he talked about a feast in eternity. He was eating with somebody at a table. And this guy uh, that was eating with Jesus at the table in Luke 14 exclaimed to Jesus, what a blessing it will be to attend a banquet in the kingdom of God. And Jesus replied with the story, a man prepared a great feast, sent out many invitations. When the banquet was ready, he said, he sent his servant to tell the guests, come, the banquet is ready. There's that invitation. But they all began making excuses. One said, I've just bought a field and must inspect it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five pairs of oxen. I want to try them out. Please excuse me. Another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant returned and told his master what they had said. His master was furious and said, Go quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. After the servant had done this, he replied, There is still room for more. So the master said, Go out into the country lanes and behind the hedges and urge anyone you find to come so that the house will be full. For none of those I first invited will get even the smallest taste of my banquet. What is Jesus talking about? He's talking about a feast for eternity. He's talking about the feast that those who have known Jesus as their Savior will get to experience. And there's an invitation. It's God's heart that none of us would perish, but that all of us would come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. There is an eternity that we are all going to face. It's either going to be an eternity with God in heaven, where there's great abundance, where there is a feast, or it's going to be an eternity in hell. 
And Jesus wants us all to be at his feast. And so there was an invitation that was sent out in this parable, come and join me at the feast. But there was those that made excuses and those that were too busy and those that were consumed with all sorts of things and they rejected the invitation. Who was the one who received the invitation? It was the poor. It was the blind. It was the ones who humbled themselves. You see, you can miss God's mercy and you can miss God's grace because of your arrogance, because of your pride. There are many that think, I don't need Jesus. I don't need him. I'm not so weak that I need a crutch. Listen to me. You need a crutch. Your eternity is at stake. You need a savior. And you can only experience the saving knowledge of Jesus. You can only experience that great feast for all of eternity if you will humble yourself and confess your need of a Savior, confess your sin. But the Bible says that the moment that you confess that He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, at that moment of confession you join Him for all of eternity at the table. And so I want to end this morning by leading you in a prayer of salvation. If you want to join the Savior at the table and eat that great feast for all of eternity, then why don't you humble yourself this morning and right where you're sitting in your home, pray with me a prayer of salvation, calling out to Jesus. Jesus, I come before you. I don't want to be one of those arrogant I don't want to be one of those who make excuses or are so caught up in the things of this world that I miss the fact that the feast for all of eternity is at stake. Lord, I want to be like the blind and the poor because I realize that's who I am. Without you, I'm nothing. I'm a sinner in need of grace. And I hear this morning you calling me to join you at the table. And I say to you, Jesus, I'm coming. I thank you for the great invitation. I'm coming. Jesus, be my Savior. Be my Lord. I confess my need of you. I confess that I'm hungry and starving and broken without you. Jesus, I come to your table. Be my Savior and be my Lord. I want to follow you all the days of my life. Jesus, let your Holy Spirit come on the inside of me. I pray this in your mighty name. Amen. If you prayed with me this morning to make Jesus your Savior, why don't you let us know? Make a comment. I prayed with the pastor today. I think there might even be a little link there that's put up there where you can uh, just indicate to us that you've prayed with us. We would love to be in contact with you, help you on your new journey in Christ.